Okay, guys, welcome to part two of the autism resources or resources for special need parents video. So this video, we're going to talk about the Georgia Medicaid waivers and specifically the now Comp waiver. So let's get into the video and see what that waiver is all about. Here, she's going to talk about ABA services and we used to have to pay for ABA out of pocket before Georgia approved it to fall under Medicaid. Medicaid was not covering ABA services, so we covered it out of pocket. But if you're in Georgia and you're looking for a good ABA company, this is the company that I use. I've been with them for four years. They're pretty good. They'll call, they're called Cadian, and you have an option to go into the office or do it at home. I'll put the link down below, but this is a very good company. I have no complaints. We're with them four years and on, and if you need a uh, ABA company and you're in Georgia, this is the one we use. I'll put the link below for parents if you need it. The goal of the service is to, is to prevent the progression of autism. Um, so if we can identify early, kids can get treatment early, um, then we see some better outcomes, right? Um, it promotes the physical and mental health of youth. So just know that those services are available. Um, Di the, I'll just, this is some of the eligibility. A diagnosis must be made by a Georgia licensed practitioner. Um, and the, there's an expectation that the, the child is using some sort of unsafe or challenging behavior that interferes with their ability to care for themselves, their communication or social skills. And this just lists the type of evaluations that the, um, that help support the eligibility. Cause you know, there's a million of these out there. So we like to give people, mm -hmm. you could ask, right? If you feel like your child has autism, and you want to get to these services when you're seeking an evaluation, you can seek providers who can provide you with the ADOS, the ADI, or the DISCO. Um, the waivers permit Georgians who are Medicaid eligible to use their Medicaid funding to receive services at home and in the community rather than an institution. They are approved by the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare, um, and they're not transferable from state to state, right? That's an important thing to remember. If you have gotten a waiver service in Georgia, um, I hope you like it here. Um, because if you move to another state, you have to go through that process again of getting the waiver service. Um, waiver mean. programs require the person to meet a specific level of care in order to be deemed eligible. And that level of care um, is the same level of care of being in a skilled nursing facility or um, an intermediate care facility for folks with disabilities. So if you're trying to help someone get support and someone is telling you well, the only way they can get that support is if they're in a nursing facility or uh, some sort of institution for folks with disabilities. That's not true. If they meet the requirement to be in a nursing facility, they can get that same level of care and support at home and in the community. So that's an important thing to remember about that level of care. This is probably what you... Okay, so before we get into the nine comp waiver, just remember, takeaway point of that slide was, if you've applied in Georgia or in Florida and you got approved, you move to another state, you have to apply all over again. So please don't forget that. And there's another um, company here in Georgia that assists special need parents. They work with a lot of special need companies for summer camp. They will pay for your summer camp. They will help pay for um, a CNA or a respite. The name is the Bobby Dot Institute. I tried to open the page, but for some reason, my Chrome won't open it, but it's called the Bobby Dot Institute. I'll try to put a link in the bottom and see how that works, but just apply. All I did is went to their website and apply. And last summer they paid for summer camp and they worked together with a now in comp waiver. So if I were you, I would start applying for Bobby dot now, and then I'll be set for summer camp when summer comes for special needs summer camp. All right, let's get into the now in comp waiver, shall we? This is probably what you came tonight to hear about, right? The now and comp waivers. Um, but it's important that we run through that information about eligibility and the services that are available to people um, so you understand um, kind of how to get through the door. So there are two specific waiver services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. They are referred to often as now and comp, it's the new options waiver and the comprehensive support waiver. Um, eligibility for this waiver is actually determined by the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Disabilities. 
Um, and the eligibility requirements are that people have gotten Medicaid eligibility, right? So you've already been deemed eligible for Medicaid. You've been diagnosed with an intellectual disability before the age of 18 or a developmental disability or other related condition prior to the age of 22, as long as it has an intellectual impact. We are not going to get into the weeds on that. The simplest way to say that is um, someone could have a traumatic brain injury at 19 and it affects their cognition. That would become a developmental disability and they would qualify because um, they're in that window between 18 and 22. There's a few other things that fit in there, but that's the best example I can probably give you. So the waiver, the non-comp waiver can be filled out online, but also here in Georgia, there's the Marcus Autism Center. My son is part of that Marcus Autism Center. He goes there every six months. He did all of his therapies there. I downloaded the application. I booked an appointment with the social worker there because the application is pretty intense and you want to do it right because if your application is not done right, they will deny it without even looking at it. So you have to keep that in mind. I booked an appointment with a social worker at the autism center. I filled out the application, brought an extra copy blank, went over there, asked her if I filled it out correctly. Whatever wasn't filled out right, she marked off. I redid the application the correct way. She went over it again and she filed it for me because I didn't really know where to file it and I just wanted it to be done right. So the social worker filed it for me. So if you feel like this is something you can't do on your own, you'll need some guidance. Being that English is my second language, there are a lot of parents out there who feel like it's too complex or maybe English is not their first language. You can also always ask the help of a social worker at the Autism Center to help you file the now and comp waiver. I just wanted to put that in there. This is a definition of developmental disabilities. Um, it's described as a severe chronic disability um, that impacts a person's that has a mental or physical impairment, um, is manifested before the individual turns 22, is likely to continue indefinitely, and results in substantial functional limitations in three or more of the following areas. So here's something that I want to say, and this isn't in the slides, but it's pretty important. Um, if you, a couple of you have children that are 16, 17 in that transition age, and you're thinking about um, them receiving now comp services, you know, later in life, even in the next five or 10 years, you want to take advantage of the school system right now to get a diagnosis, to have eligibility that is determined before the age of 22. I can't tell you how many parents call us seeking services for their children. And for whatever reason, um, through the school process, that determination didn't happen in the last couple of years, or folks don't have proof of it. It is exceedingly important that we, in order to qualify, you are going to need that. Now we'll help you out. And if there's a, an old diagnosis from when the kid was 10 or those sorts of things, we can work with that. But having a diagnosis, right? Having that diagnosis reestablished in those years right before 22, super, super important. Um, and, and the other side of that is we have people that come to us later in life. They've lived at home with mom and dad forever. They didn't apply for services, but mom and dad have gotten older and they're 45 now, right? And there's no diagnosis. We don't, we don't have school records for that. Mom and dad didn't keep up with that stuff. Schools don't have it. And that makes it really challenging to help people get through the door. So I just wanna, just a little bit of wisdom from the field um, that diagnosis around the age of 18 to 22 is super important. Yeah. Hey, Danny, there's, there's a question that, about this specifically to clarify. Mm. And it says, um, once they turn 22, they're in, are they ineligible for the now comp waiver? Um, no. But I think what the question is, what you were really saying is they have to be identified as having a developmental disability before yes. age 22. That's yes. the critical piece. I just that is sure the that critical piece. Mind. That is exactly right. Um, and, so, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to share this since we've got parents that are, we're talking about this exact thing. Um, just so you guys know about Newton County's process, we um, we only maintain records for as long as they're required required under um, under mm -hmm. law with the state archive rules. Prior to us just um, destroying records, having them shredded, we do a notice in the in the um, newspaper and um, publicize that that records will be done, and we do it basically at the time that they turn 24. 
Um, so if your child has been in the, in, you know, in the school system and is about to be 24, if you'll call our office um, and I'll put the number in the, in the um, chat so you can talk to Ms. Mitchell, who's our record specialist, you can certainly get a copy of your records. We'll actually give them to you instead of shredding them. We'd much rather do that than, than have those just go to waste. So. That's, that's really awesome, Tony. I'm not, I'm not aware of any other county that has that process, so that's really good to know. Um, but it's just really important to gather and collect and hang on to those records, right? Um, because it'll be really important for people. Um, so if you're applying right now, that's great. Um, but if life is working pretty good and you don't feel like you need to apply right now, that's okay too. Put the records in a safe place, keep it with birth certificates or whatever else is important to you um, so that down the road someone can help your child through that process. Definitely. Um, I'm going to try to fly through this a little bit because I see some questions in the chat I want to get back to. Um, but the other part about this, right, is we, we have the intellectual impact. We have the fact that it was diagnosed. It was identified before the age of 22. Um, and then there has to be functional impairments in three or more areas. That's related to self-care, related to people's receptive or expressive languages, the way they learn. Um, it's also um, around mobility or the ability and the ability to self-direct, right? Make my own choices, um, capacity for independent living and economic self-sufficiency. Um, so that's just a little bit about the definition. Um, it's important to keep that in mind when you're applying for now comp. I'm gonna touch on this a little bit too. I already used it as an example. A child or youth under the age of 22 who, who's experienced a traumatic brain injury is considered having a developmental disability based on the impact, right? So it just goes back to all that stuff I just ran through. If you have those um, impacts in functional areas, then we, we're considering it a developmental disability. Um, lifelong impact of a TBI could include things like speech and language deficits, mobility, issues with learning, abilities to make decisions. Um, and many children with TBI are often misdiagnosed as having a psychiatric disability. Um, so that's important to just, if you're in the process of trying to get access to services, um, and, you know, the only diagnosis that you're getting is psychiatric, you might want to talk to people about, is it possible that this could be a TBI? Whether this is based on an injury or maybe something that happened at birth, you should look into that. Um, so the other issue for now comp eligibility um, is that whatever the developmental disability is, has to be co a closely related condition to an intellectual disability and have characteristics that are similar to an intellectual disability. Um, so there are plenty of people who have developmental disabilities, maybe something like cerebral palsy or MS, um, but the, that the characteristics of the way it impacts them doesn't have an intellectual component um, and folks might not be found eligible for the now comp waiver. Um, and they will not, DBHD won't consider applications for people who have a primary diagnosis of a psychiatric disability. Um, so folks can, have an intellectual disability and also have a psychiatric disability, but if it's been determined that their primary diagnosis is psychiatric, then that makes it difficult to get eligibility. So that's another thing to be thinking about, especially for parents of younger children, um, that you wanna be getting that diagnosis right. Because um, maybe your kid has some behavioral health concerns, um, but that's only ever been documented through kind of a psychiatric lens. And, and maybe it is a traumatic brain injury, or maybe it is a developmental disability that can kind of be setting up um, evidence against them that makes uh, now comp eligibility a bit more difficult in the future. Um, you get to choose from kind of what they consider a menu of services. Um, and now and comp really has to do with budget, right? Um, so the now mm -hmm. waiver is a little bit smaller. The budget caps at about $40,000. It doesn't include a residential component. Um, so these are people who are receiving services. Um, you know, maybe limited services in their own home or with mom and dad, um, or maybe I'm getting some supported employment services and someone who comes out and helps me get some um, access to my community. Um, COP is for people who require a fuller range of intensive services and it includes the residential option. So these would be things like, um, you know, group living arrangements or those sorts of things. Um, the COP waiver also will have um, exceptions for people who might need more of a certain service, right? Um, so that's an important thing to recognize. Application. So being that I said that when Ramsey was an adult, I'm thinking of putting him in assisted living, he would need the comp. 
so the now we use now like if he's going to summer camp or whatever there is a budget for him every year i can call them up and say um ramsey or i call bobby dot up i don't even have to call them i can call up bobby dot and be like ramsey start in summer camp and this is the amount and he would they will he would have a budget for the year on how much he's allowed to spend and then the rest i'll just have to put in but so for now ramsey will use the now and then later on in life when he's an adult then the comp comes in for housing are online at the website there there's also a new portal um called idd connects um so if you have never applied for now comp services and you're starting this process um you can start the process fully online you can upload your your assessments you can get information back from them um, it's supposed to be a more streamlined process um, they are working to convert older applications but if you applied before you're still kind of in the the regular process there are six DBHTD regional field offices. Those are the places that are supposed to have kind of supports for people who um, are accessing services in that region. Um, and when you get the slide, you can go to the links there to see your regional field offices. Um, once you apply for services, you should be connected with what's called a, um, oh gosh, um, their intake and evaluation team. Um, and so that's the person that you'd be contacting to say, hey, I got a new assessment or I have a new question or so on and so forth to get you through the application. Once you're determined to be eligible, um, determination for services. So there's eligibility and then there's actually services and determine, determination for services is based on most in need status. So if you apply and you're eligible, but you're not determined to be most in need, then you're on what they call a planning list. And that just means they're assessing people every time services are available to determine who's most in need and is gonna get the next service that's available. Um, and once that happens, then you'd be connected to what's called a planning list administrator. That's the person that you should be contacting um, with changes and with questions. Um, if anybody here has already applied for now comp services and you're on the planning list, I'll tell you like I tell everyone, it's a system where the squeaky wheel is really gonna get the oil, right? Mm -hmm. So you wanna be in close contact with your planning list administrator. You wanna be keeping that per person updated about changes that would make the person that you're um, standing beside be considered for most in need. That's really important. Yep. Another list of services, um, that is a much longer list, but this is kind of a summary. So supported employment and pre-vocational, behavior support, specialized medical equipment, community access services, so ways for people to, to get involved in their community, nursing support, um, and support coordination. So support coordination and the residential piece is only available, uh, I'm sorry, support coordination is available in both, but the residential piece is only available in comp. All right, guys, that was it for the now in comp waiver. I say be on the list rather now than later because this is what people refer to as the list because it, the wait in the wait in time is very long for you to get there yes they say that it's on a who needed most basis but if you're not on the list at all you're not eligible for any help so i rather be on the list now than not be on it at all so if you can take your time try to fill out that form and get on that now comp list because we know what our child does now we don't know what they'll do later our special need kids change like leaves and we just have to be ready for what comes with it with that being said i'll be ending today's video and i hope there was this was very helpful and resourceful and i'll catch you in the next one bye